nice to meet all of you. I feel like I know you intimately now, um, so I feel very comfortable. Uh, today we're going to talk about what I call computational propaganda, um, but I mean propaganda in the sense of many different directions of propaganda flowing. Uh, I have a small project with a team of around four to six people, depending on who you ask, uh, and we all look at basically bots, but more importantly, politicized bots globally. So this project is housed at the University of Washington. Um, also will soon be housed at uh, Oxford Internet Institute as well. So I want to start out at the beginning <laughs> with the basics. So one of the things I always get asked when I give talks on bots, nine out of 10 times, probably not here, is what a bot is. For the sake of this talk, a bot is a software program that automates tasks on the web. For me, a social bot is something a little bit different. A social bot has direct frontline communication with people. So a social bot might be a, uh, an account on Twitter that interacts with you and chats with you about different things. It could be one of the many funny Twitter accounts. It could be a moderator on Reddit. It could be a bot on Twitter, uh, Tumblr, that, uh, one of those sites, on Tumblr that uh, puts content on Tumblr. A political bot is basically a social bot having frontline communication with hum humans that sends out political messages. Political messages on behalf of governments, on behalf of standalone political actors that might be hacktivists, or on behalf of journalists, or activists, or other civic movers and shakers. I want to start out by talking to you guys about a case, because I think it's kind of interesting to kind of have some fun and talk about the actual on the ground stuff that's happening, that's actually not happening on the ground, it's happening up in the ether, wherever it is. Um, and it is the Ecuadorian case. So about six months ago, my sister-in-law, <laughs> who is Ecuadorian, started sending me a bunch of tweets saying, hey, Sam, there's some really weird stuff going on here. Uh, and a bunch of my friends in Quito are also telling me there's a bunch of weird stuff going on here in, on Twitter. We keep seeing all these messages that are really pro-Korea, but we're not really sure like, if they're real or not. A lot of my friends are interacting with these people that are sending these tweets, and it looks kind of legit, but we're, we don't know. And at first, I was kind of, whatever, I was a little wishy-washy. It's my sister-in-law texting me about something going on, so I was like, eh, I don't know. But then I kept getting tweets from our friends, who are also Ecuadorian, and eventually I was like, oh my god, these people are actually interested in my academic research. I guess I should look into it. It never happens, by the way. Um, and so I started looking into it. I started talking to some people on the ground. Uh, I like to do uh, ethnography and field work. So my sister-in-law put me in touch with some people that were journalists. The journalists put me in touch with some technologists. And we started kind of investigating what was going on in Ecuador with political bots and to see if there was actually any political bots there. What we found was that the government was funding troll centers in Quito to send out pro-regime messages on behalf of the Korea government, and also to block conversations that were going on uh, on social media, on Twitter, uh, between activists or people that didn't support Korea. And so I was really interested about this, and I did a small write-up on Global Voices, if you have interest in looking at that further. But this is just one case amongst hundreds that we found globally. So that gives you a small taste, and it gives me a segue into my research question, which is very broad. What is the impact of political bots on public life? What happens when we have automated social actors interacting with people, and with each other, actually, a lot of the time, uh, on social media platforms? Twitter's just one example. I mentioned others. So. Three cases, Ecuador included. I already talked about Ecuador. Ecuador is a, a case of bots being used by repressive regimes to stifle conversation on social media platforms amongst their own people, but also to promote messages of the government. Russia is another really interesting case, and a lot of you might have read the recent uh, New York Times piece on the Kremlin troll factory. There's a lot of writing on Kremlin trolls. Well. Russia uses bots both on its own people and on media institutions within its own borders. So the Moscow Times recently stopped having a comments section because there were so many automated comments from bots that were pro-Putin. 
and perhaps anti-Putin too, coming from other countries. But one of the things that, Ru that Russian bots have done, and whether or not we can triangulate them, we know they're based in Russia and also based in Moscow, <laughs> um, is that they, and St. Petersburg, is that they have started attacking newspapers and institutions abroad. So, and this DDoS is not, direct, denial of, uh, direct service attacks are not a new thing with bots, but what is new is having social bots on comment sections of The Guardian, for instance, making comments that are very pro-Putin. They say, the Guardian editor said up to 40,000 comments a day were coming from Russia, Russian bots. Um, there was also another one in Forbes, uh, an article in Forbes talking about the same exact thing. Basically, lots of bots coming from Russia, commenting on the comment sections of Forbes, saying good things about Putin and the Russian regime, anytime there's an article about Russia. So that's a case of bots attacking abroad. Then there's a last case, which I like. This is kind of my baby case, like I really enjoy. It's in the United States, here. So what happens with this case is some people started, some researchers started seeing some really strange activity on Twitter. There were some proxy accounts, some bot accounts that seemed to be affiliated in some way, shape, or form with a Republican congressional campaign and then some more that were communicating with them that were affiliated with a super PAC. And what eventually was found out, the messages were garbled, but what was eventually found out was that they were tweeting to one another internal polling numbers through bots. Direct, like pretty direct coordination happening between a super PAC and, and politicians. And, and I mean, it's, it's illegal, but it's pretty much ignored a lot of the time. But it's just something that bots are very useful at doing. They're useful at hiding frontline communication between political actors like super PACs and politicians who, as we know, pretty much communicate blatantly in the public eye all the time, but technically they shouldn't be. So I can draw three implications from this. The implications are changing. Um, they are certainly not set in stone, but bots are used for social control by strict regimes. Bots are also a transnational phenomena. Russian bots attacking the Guardian. And bots are being used by political actors in democracies. They're being used in political actors in democracies to do the things like tweeting internal polling numbers. They're also used massively by politicians in the United States, Australia, South Korea, all sorts of places for follower padding. Basically, you can buy 5,000 bot followers on Fiverr for five bucks. They die off after a while, but what does that do to public opinion? What does that do to young people who are building their, their political identity? And what does that people do to people in sort of uh, emerging democracies in other countries with limited media access? So, a little bit about the project. The project is a transdisciplinary team. When we envisioned this project in the very beginning, about uh, two years ago, we were, we were thinking, we need some social scientists, but we also really need some computer scientists and some other thinkers. This is a kind of problem that you can't address by just coming from one dis disciplinary perspective within ac the academy, and also it's not something that can just be addressed in the academy, not that anything really is. Um, the PI of this project is Phil Howard, and the co-PI is David McDonald. Phil is in the communication department at UW, and now he's also at OII. David is uh, the chair of human-centered design and engineering at UW. He's a computer scientist. Uh, and then the project manager is me. And uh, we also have a researcher, Nora Bakuder, who's currently doing field work in Qatar on this question. Uh, Nora is from Saudi Arabia, and she's also tracked a lot of Middle Eastern bots for us. And she wrote a recent great paper on uh, Syrian botnet that I highly recommend you read. Um, we have a three-part research project. So the first thing that we've done is we began collecting articles from all around the world, news articles, by journalists, bloggers, what have you. And we have articles in so many different languages, uh, and we have peop about a team of about 30 people helping us code all of these articles for what journalists are saying. We're doing content analysis of these articles to see what journalists are saying is happening on the ground. And then we're coding them for how good the source is or, or like how realistic it seems and things like that. And we built a big comparative event data set, basically saying this is what is being said is going on in South Korea. This is what's being said is going on in Morocco. These are all the different cases. Then I've been doing a lot of our international field work with bot coders and trackers. 
This is my favorite part of the project, actually. I've been talking to the people who make bots. I've been talking to the people who make bots for regimes. I've been talking to the people who make bots for fun. Uh, artists who make bots, all sorts of different things to get perspective on like what they think it is that bots do. And whether or not in the political sense, they have a vested interest in what the bot does politically. And a lot of times it turns out that these people are actually uh, contractors who don't really care about the politics. They're making money, you know? And a lot of times they're not within the country that's actually launching the bots. And then the last thing we're doing is computational theory building, which is a bit nebulous. But a lot of what I'm looking at and what I'm really interested in is what it means when human actors aren't necessarily the driving force of sociality. What does it mean when we have semi-automated actors, yes, coded by humans, but that often do things that the people that code them don't expect? What it means that they are having a role in politics? There's three methods. I mentioned field work. Then we're doing the qualitative case analysis. We're also doing some large data set analysis right now. David and Nora are spearheading this, the two team members I mentioned. And they are tracking all of the tweets on the US presidential campaign right now. And we are tracking all the bots that are involved with this. And uh, it's turning out to be quite interesting. And I think it should produce some very cool results coming up. OK. So the compar comparative database of global cases, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but just to say that we have 100 plus cases of bot activity. We separate them by you know, crisis situations, election campaigns, um, and over 40 different countries, governments, governmental actors, political actors, people involved in the governments in 40 different countries have used political bots. This is a, this is a Kind of, a, it's not an estimate, but it's a growing number every day that we look at it. Um, and our hypothesis was in the very beginning that if a country was involved in a contested election or there was a security crisis in the country, that we would most likely see political bots. And that has borne out. We've tracked elections across many different countries and we have seen this happen. Um, we have cases from these countries. Australia, China, Bahrain, uh, Ecuador, then also like Syria, the UK, the USA. This is not just something that happens within re repressive regimes. It's not just Iran and Syria. It is also happening in America and uh, USA, I should say, and um, the UK and other places. So we've built kind of a bot typology. We'll be releasing a paper on this pretty soon. But this is kind of a simplistic version of it. Uh, we try to be parsimonious and include as, as much in as few examples and be simple. We have a question like, what type of political bots are there? Um, and I broke it down in basically into a binary, even though a lot of times I don't see this as a total binary because there's fuzziness in between these. There's controlling bots and there's facilitating bots. Controllers do the things that you see here. They fake, manipulate, and they jam discourse. One of them I call propaganda bots. Basically, propaganda bots are like the Russian bots that tweet pro-Kremlin uh, content to Russians or to other people. They spread propaganda on behalf of a government. The next ones are follower bots. These are the ones I mentioned that uh, basically bolster political actors' Twitter accounts or other accounts on social media. And then there's gridlock bots, which I think are very interesting. Um, I've done some previous work on activism, and these bots a lot of times specifically target protesters and activists who are trying to coordinate or chat via sites like Twitter. So what these bots do is they, out, they send thousands and thousands of spam messages to the activists using the hashtags that the activists are using, and they just clog the stream. They just clog it, and they make it so that they can't really chat using this and, and disable it. Facilitator bots are something that I really hope to do research on in the future, and they're something that I'm kind of getting into right now. But facilitator bots are bots that share information. They're bots that spread information, and they also challenge discourse. So these bots have been used a lot in the US. They've been used a lot abroad. One example is journalism bots. We have some journalists in the crowd here. Uh, there's journalism bots that have written articles. You think like QuakeBot in Los Angeles. Uh, which uh, anytime there's an earthquake, it takes in data and then it churns out a simple article. I can imagine like what they had to do to like get the byline, say QuakeBot. You know what I mean? <laughs> like kind of funny. Um, and then you have protest bots. 
Um, Mark Sample wrote an excellent article on Medium about protest bots recently, uh, about six months ago, I should say, or a year ago. Uh, and the protest bot thing is basically protest bots build momentum around a certain issue. Uh, there's been a lot of these lately, and some of them are kind of like bots that track the NSA or like that mimic what the M NSA does. So they, uh, there's NSA Prism report, I think, and it blocks out like text, and it, it's kind of a commentary. And then there's activism bots. These ones are quite interesting. Um, protest bots and activism bots, as you can imagine, are quite interrelated. But activism bots do something a little bit different, which is they are are targeted at one specific cause, like Drop the I bot, which is an uh, initiative, a bot that says to people, don't call people illegal. You know, they're not illegal. Or there was a bot about Caitlyn Jenner that corrected people when they would call Caitlyn Jenner he. They would say, I think you mean, the bot would automatically correct them and say, I think you mean she, which is something you can do automated. So the field work that I'm doing my sort of big focus on the project and what will become my dissertation is multi-method and multidisciplinary. We have computer scientists, we have information scientists, we have social scientists, and I have a, a humanities-based perspective as well, having done critical cultural work in the past. So um, we're reconsidering what ethnography is without reinventing it. We're trying to use what we've learned before in ethnography, but also make it work for technical human actors. Technical in two senses. Gina Neff talked about this in a piece with Tarleton Gillespie on Culture Digitally. Technically human, but also technological, right? Um, and we're talking to producers and consumers, people who make bots. We're also talking to people who track them for secure and trustworthy computing at Microsoft, for instance, or for other groups like Twitter. The goal is, this is uh, just an estimate, 85 interviews, we've done a lot of these, and uh, 200 plus hours of participant observation. I would hesitate to call it a true ethnography, I'd more call it field work at this point. So, my research is directly related to this, and this project was actually originally conceived as sort of a vessel for my PhD research. Uh, and then we got some grants and it kind of took on a life of its own, and uh, it's been awesome. But um, the big thing that I'm interested in uh, is bot theory. There's one part of it is bot theory and history. So what I've mentioned to you guys before, what it means uh, to have these technical social actors interacting with people on Twitter and especially talking about politics and how they affect our culture, how they affect society, how they affect public opinion. The next thing is sort of methods for studying automated actors. Like how do we how do we begin to study these actors? And so I've tried to use ethnography. Like, what does it mean to do an ethnography of information, an ethnography of bots? And then three cases. Uh, right now, I'm interviewing as many people as I can about the US presidential elections who have anything to do with data teams and things like that to find out information on bots, but also c using that in comparison with the big data analysis we're doing. So qualitative, quantitative. Um, and then the second case, because I love it so much, is the Ecuadorian case. I also have lots of connections in Ecuador, so I'm going to be spending more time there, interviewing people on the ground there. The third case, and this is tentative right now, is bots in the vaccine community. So chatting with people who are anti-vaccine and pro-vaccine, and who have both been known to use bots to attack one another. I want to get into one issue campaign and have a chat about this. Another, another possible arena is Planned Parenthood, where we've begun to see bots being used against Planned Parenthood and for, by people promoting Planned Parenthood to attack one another automatically in a way that humans could probably not do because it's so quick. So there's some topics for future research. Like I said before, this is something that can't really be gotten at by just a, one like lone communication scholar like me. I've begun to understand that, so I've started to talk to people in other disciplines. Uh, one person I've begun working with in correlation with Phil Howard, who's the PI on this project, is Ryan Kahlo, who's a lawyer and roboticist. And we've begun working on a paper on campaign finance and bots, and what it means for bots to be tweeting out information related to campaigns and money. And we found a lot of interesting cases that look very suspicious in terms of the law. And so we will be presenting at uh, Yale ISP at the Black Box, Con Black Box Conference, this paper in, in uh, I think, March or April. And we'll also be putting out a paper. It, it looks like it'll be in the Wisconsin Law Review. 
Um, the other thing is bots and public outreach. This is something I'm really interested in, and for those of you in the crowd that work with activists, that work with protesters, that work in journalism uh, or education, everyone's talking about, to me, when I talk to them, about the potential of bots in these spheres. There's definitely some worrying trends, and there's definitely potential for a lot of spam and a lot of misuse, but there's also some potential for good use as well. So, how can we think about that? The next one is uh, the idea of symbiotic socio-technical theory. So, what does it look like when bots and humans act symbiotically? I've kind of talked this into the ground about bots as social actors, but I'll leave that as it stands. And then the last, building off of that point, is ethnography of information. Moving towards ethnography that looks at non-human actors, we know that Bruno Latour, those of us that have read him in the crowd, has done work on this, looking, thinking about what it means for like, actants, non-humans, to have agency. But I want to take this a step further towards like bots as semi-human, but coded by human, sometimes coded by multiple, but having some kind of agency because recently, here's a funny case, um, in the Netherlands, a man built a bot, the bot made a death threat to someone, and the guy had no plan for this to happen, but the bot was taking information off Google. And so the police showed up at the guy's door, and they're like, this program you built has been threatening to kill people on Twitter. What's the deal? Like, are you crazy? Like, come on. And he's like, I never planned for this. So how do we study that? How do we get at that sort of a thing? Where's, where does intent come in? Where does uh, sort of like deception come in as well? So our website's politicalbots.org. Um, or .com, you can use both. We have a form, please go, and anytime you notice bot activity, nominate a political bot. <laughs> Not a bot for office, but nominate a political bot so that we can go and research it and let people know what's going on and get out that information out there. So we've had lots of people tell us about bots worldwide and we'd like to continue that trend. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, any questions right off the bat? Hey, thanks, I enjoyed that. Uh, have you looked, what does the literature say historically about, uh, I, used, I worked in politics briefly in the 90s and the, right. before the internet, so <clears throat> there's a lot of astroturfing, right? And so uh, how different is that than what we're seeing today? Obviously the kind of nature, and nature of interactivity can be much more rapid and increased and diffuse, but um, outside of that, does the literature say similar kinds of things or is yeah. it like we've seen before or is it completely different? There's been some really awesome work done at Indiana, um, Indiana University by a group there um, that have talked about, they developed this program called Truthy that looks at astroturfing online and a lot of the astroturfing is happening via humans. A lot of the spot stuff too, like there's, there's uh, cyber armies doing some of this work, but a lot of the astroturfing stuff is being done by bots too and it's sort of just sped, spreading the message of a political campaign. So that's another way of talking about it and something that we're really interested in as well. Great question. I was, you alluded to some future study where you wanted to look at some of the positive. Mm -hmm. uh, can you, do you have examples or have you seen examples of bots that are, are actually doing, uh, doing the inverse of that, trying, doing, spreading things that are positive and, and useful that it would be hard to spread as a, as a non-bot human? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that actually. So I've been doing some work um, on bots with Tim Huang, who uh, has Pacific Social Architect Incorporation, and Tim is particularly interested in exactly this question. Uh, and so we're doing a little project focused on this kind of an idea. Um, I kind of find that automation a lot of times used for so social good as well as social bad can still become noise and become spammy. But Tim, Tim and I have also found that there are some interesting ways of sending out information to, to people, anti-vaccine communities, things like this. Tim hosts competitions to see whether or not public opinion can be changed on issues that have been scientifically proven to be uh, sort of like a non-argument. So anti-vaccine, for instance, where the research has been largely discounted, um, or uh, climate change uh, is another big one. So 
having bots tweet out climate change information. Uh, I myself am a little bit hesitant about this kind of stuff. Um, I just, I just, I feel like I have more to learn before I start launching my own bots to do these sorts of things because I think that it can become very quickly a lot of spam. Um, I, I had two questions, but the first one is a simple platform question. So. Mm. Uh, you mentioned Twitter a few times, but what are the what are the key platforms that you're seeing most of these bots operate? Is it Twitter and it? Um so Twitter is one, uh, Weibo in China, um, Tumblr, a ton on Reddit, um, some on Facebook. Facebook's a little bit more tricky because the sort of algorithm is always changing. But uh, basically, all social media sites have some some type of bot activity. Going have you on. seen? Have you started study some on Kick? I have not. No. It was we're seeing quite a few on Kick. Okay. What about in texting? Uh, in texting? Yeah. Um, I haven't looked into texting, but it would be a really interesting arena. I know that there's automated texts that occur. I think we've all received them from yeah. our bank or from whatever. But I think this is another venue that this could occur, but something that I haven't looked into yet. Are you sure that your relative in Ecuador was not a bot? <laughs> well, sometimes I treat this? sometimes I treat texts like her like a bot message, but yeah. uh, I don't think she's a bot. I, yeah. I actually hung out, hung out with her over Thanksgiving, and I verified she, she's a human. Because they could be asking for research on themselves. Um, yeah. um, the comprehensive database, is it um, publicly available? It will be publicly available. We're just wrapping up our last sort of go through. Uh, in January, it should be publicly available on our website. To humans and bots. <laughs> Sorry? And bots. To humans and bots. Yes. So to humans and bots. Yeah. yeah, Yeah. exactly. Well, trust me, when you do research on bots, a lot of bots want to talk right. to you. Right. <laughs> Right. <laughs> I think that loop is, is really interesting. It is right? very, very interesting. Yeah. Yes. And, and I, I recently have been getting a lot, of, a lot of interesting action on my Twitter account from very strange bots that have been scraping stuff from my account and yeah. then accusing me of weird things. <laughs> um, first dumb response to John, which is that uh, in the United States, it's actually illegal for a bot to send you a text message um, unless you have opted in. Um, that is not true in other countries. So in India, there's a lot more going on. So just so you know, it's like, it's like one of those cases that gets really fought pretty badly. Just FYI. Cool. But the question that I have for you has to do with the social implications of these political bots, right? So part of it is we're, we're automatically assuming that there are um, negative outcomes of it. And I'm, I'm thinking about the layers that got us here, right? Mm. We have these values, right? The idea of free expression and free speech, which is a very American value, yeah. which means that why should I not be able to automate a system to magnify my speech? And a lot of what we've seen of the rise of social media and a lot of these technologies is the ability to magnify my speech mm. and is seen as a really valuable uh, possibility, particularly in an ecosystem where access becomes so critical, right? Mm. Who has access to the political operatives? You actually have to have a certain kind of power. So there's this question of, does this rework power, is that good or is that bad? Um, there's another layer to it, which is this, you know, is the ways in which um, diplomacy has always op been operationalized around the world, and that comes through propaganda, that comes through all of these other mechanisms, right. that in some ways this is an extension of that, um, and yet it also is a way in which you're changing the actors, you know, and for mm. the scholars in the room, I, I'm going to go to Castells in a second, right? So it's just like what we're seeing is a, a remaking of the, the networked architecture of who gets to be a player in these totally. moves. So with that in mind, what are, like, you know, sh how should we review, th review these? I mean, is this a bad thing? Is this a good thing? Is this just a moment of reconfiguration? Uh, what are the social implications? That's a really, really great question, and it's something I was thinking about recently um, in a paper I was writing. Uh, I think that you're spot on with this being sort of an extension of free speech, a magnification of people's perspectives. You know, you have technologies like Thunderclap that are built to do this exact same kind of thing for people. Uh, but the question is for me, and I don't mean to answer your question with a question, but I think it is, at what point does it just become outright spam, and what time do the messaging channels get clogged by bot activity? Um, we have some people here from Mexico who have t I've talked to over the course of this week as provocateur here that have said, on Twitter now in Mexico, no one trusts that anyone's a human anymore. And so it becomes like an interesting question, and, and I've discussed this with Ryan Kahlo from a legal perspective, and he doesn't want to touch it. He's like, uh, trust me, like I'm, I feel like the platforms in some ways, you know, like it's it's kind of like, 
the law is written in a way, especially in the United States, that that uh, free speech is king. And so, so these social networking platforms, a lot of times it's, you know, obviously we've had this conversation and I am not a platform, ex platform expert in any way, but it, it comes down to the platforms too. Like, will they start judging content? Will they start promoting it? Will they start allowing activists to tweet uh, or to use bots to tweet automatically and banning it from governments or what? I'm not really sure. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're <all> right. <laughs> I mean, in some ways, like that gets us back to this uh, philosophical challenge of who has the right to be a part of the public sphere. Totally. And to what degree, you know, do you know? In some ways, we've architected a representative democracy to say that not everybody actually gets to be a part of the public sphere. And what's at stake right now is these political terms where we now have the technologies where people can participate. That does not mm. mean it's at all equitable to participation. Mm -hmm. But the ability to speak, and then all of a sudden what we're reverting is who has curatorial power, who has the ability to um, pull things together, and therefore what are the networks of trust. So it's no longer the networks of access, but it's the networks, networks of trust. trust. Yeah. And when you shift to the world where you're dealing with a network of trust, part of what makes these bots so interesting to me is that they erode our pre-existing assumptions of structural entities as our trustworthy actors, um, which is one of the things I would argue we are seeing as a disruption at a political level um, far beyond the U.S. in a way where we can't get our heads around it in the U.S. Yeah. But we're seeing that move happening everywhere where all of a sudden mm -hmm. we're rebuilding networks of trust and the bots are moving us in that direction faster. Yeah, I, I think don't know if that's good or bad. But I don't know if it's good or bad either, but I think you're onto something really interesting, and I think that it's something that that I've been wrestling with a lot as I discuss, as I as I internally and think, and as I have conversations with other people about the potentials and problems. So yeah, I think you said it well enough for me not to have to say much. Well, you you sort of touched on it uh, with Dana's answer, um, but I wanted to ask so in the case of mexico like you mentioned mm. everyone like oh you there can't possibly be a supporter of this president you must be a bot right and so what does it do to that space of conversation where it doesn't even matter whether a person is a bot or not and you know what what does it do to the discourse did do, are these bots do they generally just erode the conversation so much that it becomes a place where you can't have a meaningful meaningful conversation? Have you looked at this in other places? I'd really like to look at this more in depth, you know, and I think that you know much more about the uh, the Mexican case than I do. But what I would say is, is that it's on a case-by-case -case basis, right? So in Mexico, it looks one way, whereas in Ecuador, it looks another, and in, in America, it looks another. And the ways that they're being used in different countries are different. But um, I, I, I think it is a problem in a lot of ways, like in Mexico, for people that, you know, we, we, there was a school of thought a few years back that is still very much holding on that the internet was going to be this thing that would allow us to talk about democracy and that we could organize. And there was a lot of conversation over the Arab Spring about these kinds of things happening. And, and you're, you're, you're hitting the nail on the head when you ask a question about what are these, these actors do to the communication channel, to these new communication channels? Do they, do they fog everything up? I don't know. You know, I think, I think yes, to a degree they do, but it, it's a case-by-case -case situation. Oh, okay, sorry. Robin, no, Robin, Robin. Sorry, there's a system here. <laughs> um, I, I, uh, um, just kind of extending on these, um, have you noticed situations, I've got two questions. That's two, this. yeah. Um, situations where bots are adapting to people adapting to bots? Um, and then the other one is, are you studying the inter like interactions? So muddying discourse, <laughs> sure, but are you looking at instances where people are believing that bots are people and are spreading messages or even responding to them and things like that? Yeah, so a lot of bots have built-in capacity to say to a person, and this is one of the main things that people do in the very beginning when they build a bot, a uh, political bot, is they say, I, when someone says, I think you're a bot, they say, I'm not a bot. <laughs> And the person's like, okay, that's fine. Uh, <laughs> or, or, or the bot will um, be programmed to do things that, that are sort of nuanced and funny in a way. And my friend, my friend Nate, who's also a PhD student at UW, uh, has built some of these bots basically that ask questions to people. Like uh, people will ask the bot a question or the bot will tweet out information on something and then the bot will say, what do you think about that? 
tell me more. And I, we've, I think the social people who, who build these social systems and build social bots have found that by asking people about themselves, they can throw off, throw off the scent that they might not be a person. Because uh, I don't know if you've heard of the age old adage, but people like to talk about themselves. And so, uh, and so to, and bots kind of people who build bots know this. Um, as to your other question, uh, sorry, can you remind me one more sec? I kind of answered both. Uh, yeah, yeah. What is the next stage for bots as people adapt? Well, I think that the computer scientists in the room would probably say that that deep learning is getting better, and so bots are getting more, more and more sophisticated. But we're still at a stage where a lot of bots are built by people who still build them clunkily, who, who build them in a way that you can still identify it's a bot. But the future hold, whatever the future holds is kind of tied to technology in some ways, and also tied to, to the social as well, what the governments decide they want to do. And, and I, I think it's a, a really good question, but a hard one to answer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Twitter shuts down bots all the time. Yeah, Twitter shuts down bots all the time. Um, uh, yeah, and I don't know about the Mexican context specifically, but like, uh, yes. So bots are a bit like the partisan press, maybe, trying to be like <laughs> a loud mouth piece. And there was that, uh, from the 90s, that piece of software that would mirror back to you things that you said, and I forget what it was called. It had a woman's what, name. What, Yakback or something? No, no, <laughs> from the 90s. <laughs> Eliza, yes, there's Eliza. Um, <laughs> but my question is, how specifically do you identify bots? say on Twitter? How do we identify bots? That's a really good question. Uh, one more for the computer scientists on our team, but something that I can talk about briefly. Um, Phil and I wrote an article in Tech President uh, that was on different ways for activists to detect and deal with bots and to combat them. And so, um, briefly put, uh, the, the real clunky bots you can detect quite easily because they, ha they follow tons and tons of people, but they don't have very many followers. A lot of times they don't have a profile picture. A lot of times they tweet garbled messages. But this is kind of changing a lot. Like, this is not the case with a lot of the more sophisticated bots. What we call like persona management software is being built by lots of governments. So the bot is triangulated with a, a Facebook account, a Twitter account, a uh, account on Google, these sorts of things, and has lots of pictures affiliated with it. And so then it starts to get a little more complicated. And I think that a social network analysis will still probably reveal that bots are on the tangents of the conversation. They're not actually within the network. They don't have other network ties. But I'm not a social network analyst. so. IP addresses is something that I'm sure that people have considered, but IP addresses are pretty easy to, to change um, and to have be mobile. And, and so uh, the, I think it's r it, it is difficult. Let me just say it is difficult to track when something is a bot, when it's really sophisticated. Yeah. Hi. Um, so I think it's a different version of the same question that has been asked before. But yeah. Um, so have you considered so the hypothesis that bots don't do anything? That bots don't do anything? Yeah, so it's like they exist, right? So that's interesting. Yeah. Um, but, you it's know. It's kind of a philosophical question. <laughs> no, no, but you see what <laughs> I mean? So, okay, so like, so I understand that, you know, you have different contexts, so they might do different things mm -hmm. in different contexts, right? But like, mm -hmm. what, for example, how would you compare bots with like spam? Well, bots, bots are related to spam, but when bots were first created, I think any person that was in, using the internet in the early days of the internet would say that bots were built as tools. So bots were built to do things, and they still do things on like IRC chat channels or on Drupal and things like this to remind people of events, or they're very tool-oriented and things. I think that what you're pointing out is kind of an interesting question, which is the transition. Where did, when did bots go from being like sort of... Uh, you know, more tool oriented or m like more to tool oriented and still not completely towards being something that's more oriented to spam. And so, yes, they're connected to spam, but there's something more subtle going on at times when it becomes political. And, and, and like, I don't think I haven't, I haven't theorized about this enough to be able to answer the question extremely well. But what I could say to you is that, um, when bots start to tweet political messages on behalf of governments, there's something interesting going on because it happens in a way that is uh, unlike before. And I think Dana kind of pointed that out. They're, they're changing the way that trust exists on platforms. Uh, so actually, I'm going to steal the mic for a minute and maybe push back a little further. And, mm -hmm. and um, 
kind of ask, zoomed out, um, sort of what what are the stakes of in your analysis giving this much agency to bots? What, what are the stakes you, in my analysis? Yeah, sort of what do you think it it helps us see by by sort of by choosing a frame of action by a frame of analysis that says, all right, these are these are like significantly um, autonomous. I'll use the word not super critically, like from their human agents. Like I know that you're doing interviews, but it also seems like mm -hmm. sort of what I think that that's sort of part of what Angel's question sure. was, right? Like what is this? Botanist yeah, what is botanist? That's a good question. That's something that people have really been asking a lot. That's uh, there's a scholar called Stu Geiger that uh, who's at Berkeley that talks about this a lot and has talked about this exact question in a very nuanced way. And uh, um, he would be able to answer this question better than me. But I think that the answer is that bots are integral to a lot of systems. They're integral to Wikipedia, for instance. They have a role in Wikipedia beyond what they're encoded to do by the people. They've been set up so that infrastructurally they're very, very important. But then with social bots, I think that the point that I need to make and giving some agency, I don't want to stray towards technological determinism. I don't want to stray towards uh, social construction of technology here. But what I do want to say is that in the middle of this, we have something interesting going on, which, I, which is what Gina Neff has called technical agency. They're, they do things that their coders don't intend in the very beginning. Bots, machine learning is a thing. Uh, bots can scrape information from Google. They can scrape information from all over the web. And sometimes that results in them doing things that, that we don't expect. And also, one of the things I think people really love about bots, and we have some artists that have joined us for the workshop that build bots, that behave bot-ish. They like do the bot-ish things, and that's when that's the things we love the most, and that's the sort of like funny, weird agency in the transition. I think that I, I would I would kind of push back and say that I'm not saying that they are autonomous, but I'm saying that there's a move towards that direction that needs to be examined. And I would just say one other sort of thing, which is that framing of intention. That's a specific way of looking at intention. Like we might have an analysis that would think about intention differently such that we could still think about the bots as Of being. course. Yeah, I so mean there's many different frames of looking at this. Yeah. Actually this is my question kind of builds right of that where um have you heard of the darknet bot? Uh, I have that does or is it the one that does like I've heard of darknet shopper that like goes yeah. on the darknet and buys things yeah yeah right so that for people <laughs> who don't know there's this, these, these artists called Bitnik who made a bot where every week it goes onto the deep web and the dark web sorry and it um send buys something for hundred dollars and ships it to this art gallery in is London it is it London okay London. yeah, yeah okay. I say so I think I think it's in London I might be wrong um and that is, that is purchased and over like the weeks they've bought. Everything from like fake Lacoste t-shirts to ecstasy and all of to these ecstasy, things. To ecstasy, yeah, yeah, that was the right? interesting one, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so my question is, I guess, what is the accountability for a bot like that? Because the rules didn't explicitly say that they're doing something illegal, yeah, but man. it's within this kind of gray space. I don't know. Well, I think that's a case that sort of gets at what, what, what Madeline's talking about, which is like, you know, they've, they've coded it to see what it's going to do in a weird sense. To them, it's an arts project. But there's a lot of black, like, kind of gray space there, and I think that's a really fun example and one that I've, I've talked about before. So thanks for bringing it up. Yeah. Um, anyone who has? So I, I was just wondering if you've seen bots used in, say, extremist content, which tends to be a hot topic these days. Yep. Because I could see it actually going both ways. Oh, if, yeah, I if, mean. If you address yeah. the free speech issues by counter speech, oh, yeah. bots could be used for counter speech. We've seen it a lot. Yeah. Um, thanks for bringing it up. Uh, ISIS uses a lot of bots. Um, and there's been some recent really great articles. I can't think of one off the top of my head, but if we talk afterwards, I will definitely direct you to some. Um, and then on, uh, recently, last week, Anonymous just built uh, and released a bot that tracks ISIS accounts and basically tries to shut down their messaging. So it's literally exactly what you're talking about. Because, and just to... Yeah bring it down to some other issues though I, I could see bots being used for good in terms of helping to educate just ordinary consumers that happen mm -hmm. to be online that may become victims of scams or something mm -hmm. like that where 
it can if that's a point of inter if the bot can intervene mm -hmm. you know with a tweet or a message or something with a counter message to even that sort of thing yeah and i think that a lot of very smart people are thinking uh, tim huang's another example of someone that's looking at this kind of stuff and a lot of people are thinking about it and uh it's a interesting and very sort of uh i don't use the word scary but an interesting and uh an interesting thing to look at god i'm not going to go deeper <laughs> Don't touch it. <laughs> um, you talked about the use of bots in the political sphere, and it seems that the examples from Russia and Ecuador were the government or the administration, the state, uh, using those bots. Mm -hmm. And when you talked about the U.S., you talked about congressional campaigns. Mm. So have you seen something like in mm. more democratic countries, the state or the government does mm. not use them, but only people campaigning? or activists or people, mm. see people in the political sphere, but not elected people. And whereas in um, less democratic country, yeah. uh, along the spectrum, uh, it's more uh, state. Um, so use. that's a good point and something that I thought about when I first started building a typology of bots. Um, uh, the, more, the, the further we move forward, uh, the more I see that different political actors in the states are also, uh, also have affiliations with bots or bots are, like Barack Obama, there was recently an article that showed that Obama, 70% of his followers were bots. And whether or not he bought the bots is a, is a point of contention because some people say that bots are also bought by political opponents to make people look bad. So, so you bought a bunch of bots, like you're so vain. Uh, I don't know if you guys heard about Newt Gingrich um, during the last presidential election who had like over 90% of his followers on Twitter. I mean, I know he doesn't know how to use the internet, but that's still pretty horrible. Like, uh, and, and then as to activists and hackers using bots, I think that happens in all sorts of different countries. Like anyone that has some computer knowledge like knows what bot is. And so, yeah, we were seeing that a lot. Like uh, we spent time in Hungary. I talked to some Hungarian people that were saying, yeah, we see activists using it a lot more than the government. The government doesn't know much about tech. They don't care about it. Versus like you move to Ecuador and you see the government using it more, but then you also see people on the ground using it to fight get back against the government. Mexico is a really interesting example of this where people have built bots to attack attack uh, the bots that are attacking them, activists against the government and people in between. And then people from Russia probably sending in texts that are like getting in there as well. Like, so it's, it, I mean, we, Twitter is transnational, right? So yeah, good question. Hi. Thanks for that. Um, this is sort of a selfish question because I'm <laughs> doing similar research, but I'm wondering uh, about your ethnographic approach and yeah. how you think about um, this being cited or localized and how you're doing ethnographic research. That's a really good question. Um, so I've been sort of like uh, Phil, Phil Howard and Gina Neff, who I work with really closely, and I have talked about this a lot. And so um, Phil's first book was on um, networked ethnography, so what it means to sort of study in multiple places. So I kind of take a note out of his book in that. But through Gina, I kind of have gotten into the sort of science and technology studies crowd and sort of moving towards like thinking about nuances of technology interacting with people. And, uh, but then also like my, my BA is in anthropology, so like I still really like the old school stuff, right? Like I still, I still am interested in deep hanging out a la Geertz, you know, and I still, I still think about tales of the field and like what it means to tell stories. So, uh, I think as I get into my dissertation work, I'm just writing my proposal right now. Uh, I'll know more. So we should talk. Yeah. I need to write that section. <laughs> well, <laughs> That's the answer. I'll, I'll actually ask a follow up question because I think that so much about bots is about whether they want to be deceptive or not. Mm. And so then how do those dynamics of deception and secrecy play into your access mm, to yeah. performance. I think that the one way of that, that's a really interesting point. And so at doing ethnography or field work with bots, uh, you're totally right. One way of mitigating that is to talk to the human actors that do interact with them. A lot of the old sort of digital studies stuff was looking at humans doing deep hanging out uh, on the net in different social groups, World of Warcraft, whatever. Um, but now uh, I want to try to like get at that um, but that's one of the challenges for sure. Like that's a big challenge for me and something that I'm still thinking through. Did you have one? Yeah, yeah, I have one. Is anybody doing, is anybody doing work sort of tracking the hereditary sort of like you know, the source of the bots? Because I mean, one of, listening to you, one of the things I think is fascinating is in, you know, 15 years ago we called these user agents, mm. um, which actually implied that there was some 
human being um, behind uh, them that, Whoa. That, that had some agency here. And now the term bots is much it's more giving away agency. right. And I mean, I, I, you know, two days ago, something tweeted at me. <laughs> um, uh, some, and I looked at the tweet stream. I was just showing it to Matt next to me. And their, their tweet stream is entirely random. They're clearly a bot. Um, I would love to know. I'd love to be able to go somewhere and say, where did, you know, you, this is where this came from. Or, 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 or this the, is what I know about it and help, you know, sort of crowdsource some, some sort of hereditary structure to it, right? Yeah. Um, in academic work, I've seen people do this. Um, I've seen people do this in business by building social network analyses. I don't know about a program that I could point you to that would sit, do this instantaneously or automatically. It's something I really want as well because I was mentioning to you that I've had this happen too. Um, Nora Bakuder's paper with David McDonald does do tracing uh, back to uh, with the Syrian botnet and they trace it back to the Syrian government and then to a security firm in Bahrain, um, which is quite interesting that was hired out to do consulting work. But they're, they're computer scientists and I'm not, so I'm not very good at this sort of stuff. Qualitatively looking at it, I basically do the same thing that you do. And I think that a lot of times when people are able to find out where a bot's coming from, they look at its follower list and things like that and, who, and who's interacting with it. And they're like, this is really weird. Why is this computer scientist in Russia friends with this bot's friend or something like that? So I don't have a great answer, but it is being done. Um, also, I would check out uh, Gilad Lotan's work uh, on this because, yeah, and I'm sure you have. So, yeah. So I was wondering if you were looking at the respective influence between like celebrity bots, bots with large followings, mm -hmm. versus kind of the more mass attack type bots. Was yeah. That something you do? Yeah. Um, I, I guess like I kind of bounce back and forth because I'm interested in small p politics too. Because like, what does politics mean? Like, what does it mean to be political? Is a question that I ask myself as a scholar who wants to be critical. Um, and so, yes, I'm interested in celebrity bots, but I'm not interested in the idea of celebrity. I think that there's other people who have done really good work on this. Uh, um, there, there is Amy Johnson at MIT is kind of looking at humor on Twitter and the way that bots are involved in humor. And some of those turned out to be like celebrity bots. And uh, Andres Monroy Hernandez has done some work on, on celebrity uh, online, which is really interesting. But I think it's something interesting to get at. Oh, political sense. Mm. Versus like just a, yeah, okay, okay, I see what you're saying. Okay, so uh, so we've looked at both. Um, a lot of times when we're looking at the the people with larger following, when it when it's someone like Hillary Clinton or uh, Bernie Sanders or Donald Trump, um, a lot of the work that's been done lately, not necessarily by our team but by others, has been to look at how many fake followers they have because it. But a lot of people also will say. Yeah, but a lot of these guys' tweets, a lot of these women's tweets are automated. And what does that mean? Or like it's someone else that's an intern writing them or something like that. So it's definitely a realm for further study. I think we have time for a few more. There's some other. Did you? Yeah. Um, sorry. Thank you. Um, do you know? Do have you looked at the differential effect of social bots depending on the, on the platform? What I mean is that um, on the commentary section of The Guardian, it's not, it, it doesn't seem to me, I don't know very well, but it doesn't seem to me that it's a very interactive mm. thing. People most, um, it seems that most people, when I read, every time I read the commentary section of a newspaper online, it seems just that people say what they have to say and they just like float fly away. Or like and two people get into an argument the whole time. Yeah. Yeah. And from time to time they have an argument. Whereas yeah. on Twitter, for instance, you care whether or not you're interacting with 90% of people who are bots. Mm -hmm. And there is probably a much better analogy in anthropology, but in the economics you have the market of lemons, where for cars, if you have uh, people who sell a car and you have an uncertainty about the quality of the car that you're going to buy, uh, then only people who don't really care about the quality are going to stay. And then you have kind of a vicious circle where the, the bad quality of the people you interact with does not make you want to be really active. And so mm. the, you have then a decrease in the quality or of people and you will end up with having Twitter only between bots, basically. Yeah, so I, I guess there's, there's, there's a, one thing to say about that is that, there's, that different bots do different things. Uh, and so there, you know, there's definitely bots that are just programmed to tweet out. They just tweet out messages and then they leave it alone. Like yesterday we launched a bot during this provocateur in residence thing that I'm hosting here called Data Wonderland. 
and it's just programmed to take from the corpus of Alice in Wonderland and take any tweets on big data and mash them together to kind of make a funny tweet about craziness of data sometimes. Um, versus another bot, other kinds of bots that are tweeted to directly interact and that can have a conversation. Like some of the bots I mentioned my friend Nate builds, which interact with the person in a way that uh, up until a point is fairly good and then it does tend to devolve after a while. Um, and I think you're getting at the point that we've kind of been talking about, which is that, uh, which is that yes, that is the big fear, like that these platforms will be reduced to spam. But I, 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 I don't, I don't know if they will let that happen. Um. Okay, great. Unless anyone's dying to ask one more question, we'll we'll end a tad early. So Sam, thank you so much. Thank you all very much. Thank you.